So my name is Sarah Delaney. I'm a breast medical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston and chief of our, our breast oncology program here. I'm joined by my very esteemed colleagues and friends today, uh, Dr. Aditya Bardia, who is director of the Breast Cancer Research Program at Massachusetts General Hospital and is associate professor of medicine oh. at Medical School, as well as uh, Dr. Frederic Penelt Yorka, who is a professor of pathology and comes to us uh, from France. So, uh, really a wonderful uh, panel here because we have expertise in clinical development of SIRDs as well as pathological testing uh, that is required to make decisions uh, in this space. So I think just for today's purposes, things that we do want to make sure uh, you all take away from our program today is that Elisestrant is really the first oral CERD to be yeah. FDA approved, uh, which was approved in January of this year. Um, for patients who have advanced metastatic breast cancer, there's also an FDA approved um, ctDNA assay as a diagnostic assay to help make this diagnosis of having an ESR1 mutant breast cancer. And we're going to hear more about this from Frederick today about the importance of testing and how best to test. We're also going to talk about the landscape because it is complicated to make decisions about what therapy to administer, particularly after progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor, where in fact you have several uh, therapeutic options to consider. And we'll talk about how to think about oral surds in this space. And we'll also talk about the other agents that are in this space, again, to put it into context now with availability of oral p kinase inhibitors, certainly CDK4-6 inhibition, a targeted PARP inhibitor therapy, and hopefully soon we'll have an AKT inhibitor in this space. And then again, uh, to touch upon the best ways to figure out if someone has an ESR1 mutation and really the critical nature of using a liquid biopsy at time of progression on endocrine therapy. So to kick us off, I'll turn to the next slide and we'll turn to Dr. Bardia, who is really going to give us an overview of oral SIRDs and how they fit into the treatment landscape. Uh, so Dithya has obviously been very critical in developing oral SIRDs. It's really nice to have him with us here today. Uh, thank you, Dithya. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tulani. It's a pleasure to be here today and discuss the overview of SIRDs as well as their place in treatment landscape. So I'll provide a general overview as to why SIRDs are important, the development of SIRDs, and end with an algorithm that we recommend at this time. So I'm a medical oncologist. I thought I would start with a patient story, a common patient story we see in clinic. Uh, this is a 55-year-old female with hormone receptor positive breast cancer, received adjuvant tamoxifen. She was premenopausal at that time, and then years later had disease recurrence. She was postmenopausal now and received letrozole plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor that worked for a while, and then the patient had disease progression. So now the question is, what should be the therapy in the second line setting for a patient who has received prior CDK4-6? This is a bowling question, and you can send in your answers. Full vestrant, full vestrant plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor, exomestin nevrolimus, or a clinical trial. Okay, so we have a good mix of responses, and that is to be expected because, you know, all of these are reasonable options. Clinical trial is always reasonable if you have a good clinical trial. Uh, some would consider full vestrant alone. Some would combine it with a CDK4-6 inhibitor. Exomestin nevrolimus is also very reasonable. I think all of these were reasonable options as of, say, a couple of years ago. But now the landscape has changed. And one thing I would need before answering this question is what's the genotype status of this patient? This patient needs uh, either tumor genotyping or ideally plasma-based genotyping because that would guide the therapy in the second line setting. So this patient had ctDNA analyses done, which revealed an ESR1 mutation. And so what therapy would you now consider given that this patient had known ESR1 mutation? Fulvestrin, fulvestrin CDK4-6, XMST nevrolimus, or elacestrin. Okay, so we see some switch now, less interest in fulvestrin and more interest in elacestrin, uh, which makes sense. So over the next five to seven minutes, I'll review the development of surge, including elacestrin, as well as other agents. Before we do that, let's first start with understanding endocrine therapy resistance. So this patient had disease progression on letrozole plus CDK4-6 inhibitor. The question is, why did this patient have disease progression? And there are two broad possibilities. One is that the tumor is resistant 
because of mutations in the estrogen receptor. So it's still ER dependent, but it has estrogen independent, ER dependent signaling. Or the other possibility is that the tumor is both estrogen and ER independent. So when there are mutations in the estrogen receptor, the tumor is estrogen independent, but it is still dependent on the estrogen receptor. So drugs like letrozole will have limited activity because they lower estrogen, but drugs that directly bind to the estrogen receptor would potentially still have clinical activity. The challenge is that at the doses that fulvescent is used in clinic, it's not a very strong degrader, particularly for ESR1 mutations. It's not able to suppress ESR1 mutations very well. And that has led to interest in novel estrogen receptor degraders, Example being elacestrant. So elacestrant was evaluated first in a clinical trial, phase one, phase two trial, where it showed responses and a CBR rate of 42%. And there was a clear signal in patients who had prior ESR1 mutations. So this led to the phase three trial, the Emerald trial, which looked at elacestrant was his investigated choice of therapy, including fulvestrant. And this was in the second line plus setting, patients with ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer who had received prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. So very similar to the case that we reviewed, this was the setting. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival in all patients, and the study had two primary endpoints. So one was all patients, the second was in patients with mutant ESR1 detected by ctDNA. The idea was that patients who have detectable ctDNA, we should see a signal given what had been seen in the phase one, phase two trial, and based on the idea that these are tumors that are more driven or more dependent on ER. The choice of uh, endocrine therapy was fulvestrant or AIs. Majority of the patients, two-thirds of the patients in the trial received fulvestrant. So in terms of primary results, the study met its primary results. There was improvement in progression-free survival uh, with a hazard ratio that was close to a 0.5 in patients with ESR1 mutations. But I think an important thing in the trial was if you look at the curves, the Kaplan-Meier curves, we see an initial drop and then separation. This is something that's been seen in other clinical trials in this space as well. This initial drop reflects endocrine-resistant disease. This is second-line plus setting. If the tumors are ER-independent, it's unlikely that endocrine monotherapy is going to work in this setting. So you'll see progression regardless of the type of endocrine therapy. But then after that, you start to see separation. So that's likely more endocrine sensitive disease where a better endocrine agent outperforms fulvestrant. So PFS rate is a better metric at this time, given this initial drop, just looking at median PFS can be misleading. So PFS rate at six and 12 months was much better uh, with elacestrant as compared to standard endocrine therapy. And you could particularly see that for uh, patients who had detectable ESR1 mutations. So let's come to the uh, final question, which is now according to the data presented in the Emerald trial, which of the following patients would benefit from elacestrant? Patients with ESR1 wild type, patients with ESR1 mutations, but prior duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor less than 12 months, C, more than 12 months, and D, all of the above. So this is great. So it's clear that the activity of, e, of elacestrant is more in patients who have detectable ESR1 mutations. Now, in terms of the prior duration of CDK4-6, as I mentioned previously, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, we see an initial drop followed by separation. The question is, can we identify patients who have this initial drop so the team looked at prior duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor as a surrogate marker to identify endocrine-sensitive versus endocrine-resistant disease. And they, they saw that patients who had been on CDK4-6 inhibitor for at least 12 months, these were the patients who had more endocrine-sensitive disease as compared to those who had disease progression in the first 12 months, which makes sense. So if we look at Patients who had been on CDK4-6 inhibitor for at least 12 months, you see a median PFS of 8.6 months with elacestrant versus two months with endocrine therapy because there's less initial drop in the curve. So early on, you're able to see separation and therefore the median PFS is much better. So clinically, some feel that this is a biomarker that should be used in clinic. 
we should look at the prior duration of CDK4-6 inhibitor before deciding to use elacestrant as monotherapy. So this led to the approval of elacestrant or OSERDU, I think that's oral SERD and then U, for patients with ESR1 mutant ER positive HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. And as per FDA approval, it's for patients who receive at least one line of endocrine therapy. So in the second line and plus setting. Now, in terms of safety, there are side effects that can be seen with elacestrant. It's given as an oral pill. So this is a polling question in terms of common side effects seen with elacestrant, diarrhea, dyspepsia, nausea, arthralgia, nausea, back pain, back pain, fatigue. Correct. So dyspepsia is the most common side effect. Nausea or dyspepsia is the most common side effect that's seen with elacestrant. It's an oral pill. The other side effect that has been described with uh, elacestrant includes back pain, some incidents of uh, arthralgias as well. So overall, when I counsel a patient, I say that, you know, it's likely that you will have nausea. Most patients do not need anti-nausea medications. So it's not severe nausea like chemotherapy where you need antiemetics, but it is something good for the patients to be aware of. Now, besides elacestrin, there are other SERDs in clinical development as well. This is a list of the different oral SERDs, geradestrin, immunestrin, comizazestrin. And besides that, uh, there are other agents uh, like rintodestrin that are in clinical development. Some of these drugs are in phase three. Amsinestrin was an oral SERD that was in development, but its clinical development has been discontinued. One thing I would say is that we need to be very careful with cross trial comparisons because there could be differences in prior lines of therapy, the endocrine sensitivity between the different populations in biology. So we need to be very careful with cross trial comparisons. Now, if you look at the uh, clinical drugs that are in development, so one is geradestrin, uh, one is comizazestrin, and the other is immunolestrin. They are in clinical development in the first line setting as well as the second line setting. So this table summarizes uh, these drugs. The Persevera trial is looking at geradestrin in the first line setting in combination with palbocyclin. Serena 6 is looking at comizazestrin, more like hybrid 1.5. So it's for patients who have detectable ESR1 mutations in the first line setting. And at the time of detectable ESR1 mutations, continuing the same therapy or switch to comizestrin. And AMBER 3 is similar to Emerald, that it's a second line plus set setting trial looking at immunodestrin versus endocrine therapy. The trial has a third arm which is immunolestrin plus abemacyclin. So essentially it's looking at both monotherapy as well as combination therapy uh, with the CDK4-6 inhibitor. So in summary, if you look at the treatment algorithm at this time for a patient with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, we would recommend endocrine therapy plus a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first line setting. In the second line setting, strongly recommend tumor genotyping, ideally plasma-based genotyping. If a patient has detectable ESR1 mutation, consider elacestrin. If a patient has PIK3C mutation, endocrine therapy plus alpelacib and no actionable alteration, and you could consider endocrine therapy plus minus CDK4-6 inhibitor. And in the third line setting, we generally continue endocrine-based therapy. And once endocrine-based therapy options are exhausted, that's when we would consider chemotherapy and antibody drug conjugate. In any setting, it's always reasonable to consider a good clinical trial. So in conclusion, endocrine therapy is the mainstay of management for a patient with hormone receptive positive breast cancer. Elacestrin and oral SERD has demonstrated superiority over standard endocrine therapy in the second third line setting and FDA approved for ESR1 mutant metastatic breast cancer. It has a manageable toxicity with nausea being the most common side effect, usually grade one, grade two in severity. Most patients do not need antiemetics. There are several other oral surgeries in clinical development, which alone or in combination with other targeted therapy will likely redefine the therapeutic landscape of breast cancer. Thank you for your attention. We'll move on to the next section. Uh, thank you, Aditya. That was an excellent uh, overview of Elicestrant and really highlights how uh, development occurred and really how we got an approval for Elicestrant in the ESR1 mutant population. 
So one question I was wondering if we could address, because this has come up uh, quite a bit, is if you have a premenopausal patient who needs L-acesterant, how are you handling that? And are you mandating all those patients get ovarian suppression? And what's really the rationale behind that? Yeah, and a good question. So I think um, a patient who is premenopausal, in general, we would consider ovarian suppression in the metastatic setting. For example, when we use uh, fulvestrant and definitely AIs in general, we do consider ovarian suppression. And most clinical trials in the metastatic setting do allow premenopausal patients along with ovarian suppressions because in a way the patient becomes postmenopausal when you use ovarian suppression. So if I were to use elacestrant, I would use it in combination with ovarian suppression in this setting. Uh, over time, we probably need data to see whether ovarian suppression is really needed when we are using surge, which are blocking estrogen receptor directly. But till we have the data, I would feel more comfortable with using ovarian suppression plus these endocrine agents in the metastatic setting. I think that's really helpful and important for, for clinicians to certainly be aware of that um, if you're going to start a premenopausal patient on elicesterant for now, make sure they are suppressed. But as Dr. Barty pointed out, we do need more data with regards to sort of need for suppressing ovaries uh, in this setting with oral surds. I think another question comes up, and you had a really nice slide with an algorithm of sort of how you think about which patients should get elicesterant based on um, genomic alterations. Um, with sort of favoring use of elicesterant in the ESR1 mutant population, thinking about a PI3 kinase uh, inhibitor, for example, in a PIK3CA mutant patient. Can you explain what if a patient has both uh, an ESR1 <laughs> mutation and a PI3 kinase mutation? How are you then thinking about uh, treatment selection there? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And it is something that we do see in clinic. These are not mutually exclusive mutations. You can have both ESR1 and PIK3CA. And I think that highlights uh, genomic heterogeneity, uh, given that some tumors who have ESR1 mutations are more ER dependent. Those who have PIK3C mutation probably more dependent on the PI3 kinase pathway and more uh, ER independent. Ideally, I would like to see elacestrin plus alpalacib or a PI3 kinase inhibitor yeah. in this setting because that would address both those alterations. And there are ongoing trials like the Elevate trial that's uh, looking at this combination. But till we have the trial data, I think uh, it's a patient-centered discussion. You could start with full Western plus alpelacib uh, and review the side effects. And then at the time of disease progression, you could consider elacestrant or vice versa. Because in the metastatic setting, it's a matter of using these drugs in sequence. So you review both the options, the potential efficacy and side effects, and then you can make an informed decision that's patient-centric. I think that's an excellent point uh, that, that we do have opportunities to sequence. And I think you point out a, a good thing to make sure that we are really factoring in clinical presentation and, you know, obviously other comorbidities, for example, if someone has underlying diabetes and may not be a candidate for alpalacib, obviously all those things get factored in. To make this more complicated, we may get CAPIVACERTIB approval later this year, and we'll have to see how that um, approval happens, whether it will be in the biomarker altered population or not because that certainly can change this algorithm uh, quite a bit once we see that. But I, I really like your point about being able to hopefully in the future see combinations of SIRS with targeted agents in this space, because to me, that seems like a, a really important um, thing to address. 